Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to tutorial on digital to analog converters or DACs and we'll look at an example using microchips MCP4728. And this is going to be part one in a two-part series. Before we get started, as always, uh, if you're interested in Forstronics design, consulting, or manufacturing services, check out our website at forstronics.com. If you like what you see here, please subscribe to my channel, or if you're already subscribed, hit the thumbs up on the video. All right, let's get started. Okay, so this is gonna be two parts, as I mentioned. In part one, we're really just gonna look at what is a DAC, uh, what is the theory behind DACs, how do they work, what are some of the specs we care about, and some simple examples with the uh, MCP4728. And then part two, we really dive into the the MCP4728, which is a four channel digital analog converter or DAC from microchip. And we'll look at some Arduino library examples and some programming examples in part two. So part one, more on the theory about what a DAC is with some simple examples. And then um, part two, we dive into more on a specific DAC that's real easy to use, real popular on the market. Okay, let's dive into an overview on DACs or digital to analog converters sometimes referred to as D to A's. I'm going to use DAC typically, but what is it? What do they do? Well, they're sort of the opposite of an ADC, right? An ADC takes an analog signal, measures it and converts it into a representative binary or digital value. A DAC takes a binary value and converts it into an analog value. Now that could be current or amplitude slash voltage. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to talk in terms of amplitude and voltage, but a DAC could have a current output. You know, this is getting into the history of them, but even before transistors, they had they had the concept of a DAC. And so in the past, you know, decades and decades ago, DACs were built using discrete components. Then as time went on, they started being a handful or a mixture of ICs. So one would be maybe the, the core functionality of the DAC, another one might be an amplifier, so on and so forth. But today, you can find very integrated functional DACs in a single chip, so like the MCP2748, which we'll see has more than just DACs in it, as we'll, we'll see in an example. Or you can find them in microcontrollers or microprocessors. For instance, the SAM D21, which is used on the Arduino Zero, as well as the Arduino Maker series, it has a single DAC in one of its analog channels. So today, very integrated, very easy to use. And some of the key attributes, and I say three key attributes, I know when people see this, you know, if someone has an idea of what one, a different one should be for a key one, they'll say something. So these are the three ones in my experience. And so DACs have a lot of specs and functionality and performance specs. But the three key things you're typically worried about when you're getting a DAC is its resolution. And that's the ability to resolve a particular value. And remember, since it's a binary input, that's binary numbers are not continuous, they're, they're discrete. So we're having an analog output. Let's say our DAC can go from zero to five volts. We can't cover every little value in that zero to five volts. We're limited by the bits of the DAC, and I'll talk more about this. But the idea is a DAC has a discrete output, not a continuous output. So we gotta worry about the resolution, the accuracy. How close is the output to what you're really set for? You know, you might be set for a one volt output, but you're only getting, uh, I don't know, you're maybe getting 1.1, which is 100 millivolts off, which is a huge factor of error. You know, that, that relates to accuracy. And there's a lot of specs, and we won't have time to go through them all, but there's a lot of specs that can affect a, a DAX accuracy. And then speed. How fast can you change from one output to the next? And speed is often related to resolution. The faster you go, the typically the lower the resolution you have. So some DACs will have a max resolution, but if you use them at their max speed, their resolution gets trimmed down. And also something to keep in mind related to accuracy and resolution, you could have a ton of resolution, but if you don't have great accuracy, you're basically wasting that resolution because that resolution is hidden in the noise or the error noise. Okay, so let's talk about these three attributes in a little more detail. Let's talk about resolution and this will help, if you're still not sure what a DAC is, this will help you understand what exactly a DAC is. One good way to compare a DAC 
or a, a nice reference for what a DAC is, is if you think of a microcontroller, you know, whether you're an Arduino user or even a Raspberry Pi, which is a microprocessor or, you know, some kind of hardcore Texas Instrument microcontroller user, we all know what a digital pin is or a GP pin. And a digital pin, we can typically write VCC. Let's just, for this video, let's assume VCC is five volts, or you can write low, which tends to be zero volts. So you can think of a digital or GP pin as a one bit DAC, right? It has two states. It's either five volts or zero volts. So you could see the, revolu the resolution in a DAC like this would be VCC or five volts, because you're either zero or five. Okay, well, let's be a little more realistic. What if we had a three bit DAC? So what does that mean? It means three ones or zeros. And the idea is when with a three bit DAC, you have eight distinct values. The way we know that right is we take binary is a base two number system. So we take two to the three and we get eight. But really, when we say eight values, we really zero is one of them. So you really only have seven if you're not counting zero. And so I kind of did an example of this on the right and I put it as stair steps. So each horizontal step represents a DAC output value. So if we assume that we have VREF or VCC, and I'll talk about what VREF means, but is five volts and our DAC goes from VREF to ground. So five volts to zero volts and we have eight distinct states, but one of them zero. So we would divide five by seven and we get 0.714 spaced apart. So that means we can do values from zero to five, but each value will be 0.714 volts spaced apart. So essentially our resolution is 0.714. What could our error be because of our lack of resolution? Now this doesn't have to do with accuracy. This is just due to resolution. We would say, at any given time, our error due to resolution will not be more than 0.357 volts, which is half of 0.714. And that's because, let's say we have a value somewhere along here that we want to reach. Well, if it's here, we would just do this step. And if it's closer to the top here, we would just do this step. Now, we can't land on these exact values in this continuum, but we can only be halfway away at the most. So if we were trying to output this voltage right here, we would be 0.357 volts off max, assuming everything else is ideal. But just something to, to keep in mind, this is a limitation because the DAC is, does not have a continuous output. Okay, and three bit was used just to make things easy. Typically DACs are more like 10 bits, 12 bits, 14 bits, 16 bits, 18 bits. And the MCP, which is a four, MCP 4728, which is a four channel DAC has 12 bits. So that means 4,096 distinct values or levels it can output. And once again, I got that by taking two to the 12th power. But remember, zero is one of those. So you really just have 4,095 levels. And if we're assuming VCC is five volts or, or a reference voltage is five volts, that means our resolution is 1.2 millivolts, much better than, than when we had our three bit DAC and we had over 700 millivolts. So that's how resolution works when we talk about DACs. And you heard me mention VREF or VCC. The idea for an ADC or a DAC is you have to have a reference voltage, right? So Arduino uses the VCC as its reference voltage, but you could also use an external voltage reference if you wanted more accuracy because a power supply's voltage level is not highly accurate. Or some ADCs and DACs have built-in references. In fact, the MCP4728 has a built-in one. So you can either use an external one, you could either use the power supply, or it has an internal one. And th the reason this is so critical, first of all, it sets the range of the DAC. But second, if you have error on your reference voltage, then that error automatically translates to your DAC values, right? If your power supply is outputting 5.05, that means every DAC value is gonna be 50 millivolts off because your reference is off. So it's important to have a good, stable, accurate reference if, if having a very accurate DAC output is important. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about speed. And, and as I talk about all these things, I sort of uh, talk a little bit more about a DAC in general. So if we think of a DAC as a black box here, our binary input, so this would be a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight bit DAC. You know, you would feed in the binary value in parallel and you would output the equivalent analog value. I've kind of used these cutoffs for sample rates. Now, to be careful because, you know, when I talk about the, the upper end of these cutoffs or the lower end of these cutoffs, there's obviously overlap, but but for, for the sake of this, I tried to pick a, a cutoff area. So for low frequency or low output rate DACs, ones that only can output up to, you know, less than tens of mega samples per second. And the MCP4728 is a lower frequency DAC. It, I think it can do 100 kilosamples or 150 kilosamples per second or something like that. But for these type of DACs, typically, you don't use this old parallel interface. You would typically use SPI or I squared C or some type of embedded communication protocol that's fast enough because you want to be able to stream at this rate, right? For instance, the MCP4728 has an I squared C interface. And for these types of DACs, you can control them with a microcontroller, right? You can use other stuff as well, but a microcontroller will work because a microcontroller can do SPI and I squared C. And of course, micro, some microcontrollers have DACs in them. And, and for these type of lower frequency rate, I mean, there's a ton of applications, but one of the reasons I'm doing this video is I'm working on an industrial control application where I have to output an analog value with a DAC to show the position of a valve. So a lot of industrial controls, process controls, applications for lower frequency DACs. You can also use them to simulate sensor outputs, analog sensor outputs for testing purposes. Then you get into the high sample rate DACs. And this is where the engineering gets much more difficult. And so now we're talking about DACs that can do tens of mega samples per second or hundreds of mega samples per second or giga samples per second. Typically with these type of DACs, you're going to need either a microprocessor or an FPGA. And in fact, this is where FPGAs are used a lot. And so these faster DACs, you know, sometimes get out of the reach of hobbyists because of the complexity. And even if there's a problem because things are moving so fast, you often need expensive instruments to debug if there's an issue with, with some of these faster DACs. So for instance, for some of these faster DACs, they may actually have this type of parallel configuration. And what you would do is you would configure an, an FPGA that's, that has a really fast clock to basically clock in the DAC values at hundreds of mega samples per second or whatever. And a lot of times they use a, a voltage transfer level called LVDS, low voltage. Or if you don't want to use an LVDS interface and do the parallel programming using something like an FPGA, you can use high speed serial communication like JESB 204B. And these are, this is serial communication like SPI or I squared C, but it's super fast. It can be at giga samples per second. Um, I shouldn't say samples, I should say um, gigabits. And this, this you could do with an FPGA or sometimes you can find a microprocessor that may have a JESB 204B um, interface. Now, so for some of these faster ones, they may allow you to change settings using SPI, but to actually stream the data, they require one of these high speed interfaces. And that's because these don't have memory on them and they want you to be able to stream the data in real time. Okay, and these type of DACs are used for modulating wireless signals, you know, I and Q, radar. They're used for high end waveform and ARB generation instruments. But anyway, we're, we're gonna focus more on the low data rate, but I did want to point out the high data rate and there is some design challenges to using those. Okay, let's look at a DAC architecture. So there's a lot of different DAC architectures out there. I picked one of the, or if not the, the most basic. So this is what's referred to as a Kelvin divider. So if you wanted to build your own DAC, you could do, you could do it using this concept. And sometimes a Kelvin divider is also called a string DAC. But it's a very simple concept and they use a three bit example for simplicity purposes. But here we have our reference voltage and then we have a bunch of resistors 
and these resistors are balanced, meaning that they're the same value. They're supposed to be very close in value to each other. And the idea is, no, this is not shown here, but you have some kind of logic, right? So you're putting in a three bit value and depending on what that three bit value is, it closes one of these switches. And you know, these are for example, both purposes, these are showing up as mechanical switches, but these would really probably be solid state switches. So what happens is, if I want the highest DAC value, I would close this switch, which would probably be 111, close this, I get the full voltage drop right here, and that feeds to my analog output. If I wanted ground 000, I would close this switch, and I'm directly connected to ground, so my output is zero volts. And then you have everything in between, and you can do the calculation yourself, right? Because we know what a three bit DAC values can be. But the whole idea is you're just closing the switch to where that voltage will be dropped and then feeding it to your analog output. One thing you have to keep in mind though with DACs is they're not power supplies, meaning they have a, they're, they're expecting to feed a high impedance device. They don't have a lot of current backing them up. So you need to be conscious of what your load is, because if your load is too low or draws too much current, your DAC value is not going to hold the right voltage. And the reason I bring that up for this architecture is you could see that with this one downside of this architecture is you don't get the same current each time. So if, if I turn on this switch, for instance, I have to go through all these resistors, which is going to reduce my current. So I could actually get a sort of variations in my voltage just due to loading because you don't have the exact same current at each rung of this divider. Now the way you get around this though is you put in an op amp, right? Which has a very low impedance input and, uh, no, excuse me, high impedance input and low impedance output. Basically meaning it can add some current if you have a, a load that requires more current. And then if we start to think about accuracy, you know, I already mentioned, what if VREF is not exact? Well, that's gonna immediately cause problems with accuracy. Well, what if your R's are not equal? Well, that's gonna cause, you know, non-linearity or, or accuracy problems for different inputs or outputs. And then what if you have a buffer amplifier like I just mentioned, and that has some kind of offset error and other factors of error. You can see there's a lot of things that can contribute to slight accuracy problems in, in DAX. By the way, I got this picture from a great tutorial. I, you know, I don't like to steal stuff. So this is from Analog Devices. They have this great long handbook on all types of things, but includes ADCs and DACs. And uh, you can see a link. I'll put a link in my video description as well if you want to check that out for more information. A lot more detail than what I'm covering here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about accuracy. And, and this isn't to scare you, it's just to make you aware that you know there's a lot of things that contribute to accuracy. And typically accuracy is specced on a, on a DAC data sheet in either millivolts or LSB, which stands for least significant bit. If we think of DACs, the least significant bit would be this bit right here, the bit that has the least effect on the output value. For instance, if you go through the accuracy specs and you get one or two least significant bits, that is essentially taking away from your resolution. And ADCs and DACs sometimes have a spec called ENOB, which stands for effective number of bits. If your resolution overshoots your accuracy, you're basically wasting bits because they're no longer useful because you don't know what the accuracy is. Or you know that the accuracy, the random noise can be bad to the point where that that bit of resolution is no longer useful. But least significant bit, if you see MSB, that would be most significant bit, that would be this bit here. It has, by changing it to a one or a zero, you drastically change the output value. With the least significant bit, it's the, it's, you know, the least effect on it. Uh, examples of error or accuracy specs. So integral nonlinearity, differential nonlinearity, offset error, that just means you know, you're not at the exact voltage you think you're at. Full scale error, that means you're not reaching, you know, your, your top V reference value. Gain error, gain error drift, offset error drift, DAC to DAC crosstalk. So that's, that's something you can observe in, in a DAC that has more than one output channel. It's just the effect, the parasitics taking energy from one DAC output to the other and causing error. So I didn't go into all of these 
in detail, but I'll, I'll just discuss a couple. So this is from the MCP 4728 data sheet. And here they're, they're showing, I believe this is uh, integral nonlinearity. I should have it labeled here. Uh, but they're basically showing how through the whole range of the DAC, you may have errors. So if you think of the example architecture I just showed, this could be caused by not having exact resistor values everywhere. So ideally your DAC would have followed this straight line, but it doesn't. And you can see they're using examples using least significant bit. This is, this is out of their data sheet where they're trying to explain some of their errors. So that's, you know, if you don't know what an error, what a certain error is, a lot of times the data sheet will, will have an explanation. And I also wanted to show, here's actually two types of error. So this is due to uh, basically similar things where the, the DAC is not following the correct curve. And, and basically you can see they have gain error as one of the labels, but they also have offset error. So here they're showing this is, this is the error, but this is due to offset as well as gain error. Once again, explained in the data sheet. Okay, and here I wanted to show an example architecture of a DAC. This is more of a high-level architecture. This is for the MCP4728, which we'll be talking a lot more and showing more examples in, in part two. But, so let me walk through this real quick. VDD is your power supply input. It could also be your reference as well. VSS is essentially ground. This, this can't go below zero volts. Uh, SDA and SCL are your I2C inputs. Uh, this is just a pin that tells if it's writing to memory. Uh, I'll explain this in a second, but this is a four channel DAC. Here's our input register. You could have an option where the value is written to EEPROM, and that way when the DAC powers up again, it automatically looks at EEPROM and sets its output value right away. So that's one of the features this, this DAC has. Uh, once again, remember, this is a serial input, so these these registers are taking this serial data and then turning it into parallel data to feed to the actual DAC block. So notice this has a string DAC, just like the one we showed. Uh, a lot of times, and I don't know if this is the case for this one, but a lot of times these chips will actually have more than one DAC architecture. So for the most significant bits, it might use one type of DAC architecture. And then for the least significant bits, it might use a different type of DAC architecture. You can see there's a buffer amp on the output. And this is so we can deal with different size loads. And then this also has gain control. So it can output just as a buffer amp, no, no gain, or it could have a gain of times two. So it could double the output. Of course, you're not gonna be able to double it past whatever the value of VDD is, because VDD is feeding this op amp. Notice you have this LDAC uh, pin. This basically says don't output until this goes low. Now you could tie this to low and it'll just output the newest value, or if you want them to output it all at the same time, a new value, you would use this pin. Here, this has an internal reference of 2.048. It also allows you to select what reference you wanna use for each individual DAC. But anyway, the point here is I, I wanted to show, and I'll probably start off part two with this again, but I just wanted to show that, you know, this is actually the only part that's the DAC, the true DAC, but you can see in these modern fully integrated chips, they have a lot of other pieces in there to add features. All right, let's look at a simple example of this DAC in action. Okay, I'm just gonna show a quick video. Here is an Arduino Uno. Here is my board, custom board that I made, and we're gonna see the DAC on there, so I'm gonna zoom in on it in a second. All right, so here is the MCP4728. This is an op amp, this is a regulator chip. I have you know, some resistors around here and, and I'll show you how to lay this out in part two. Th this board is nothing special. A lot of times when I'm working with new parts, I like to make a board to just make sure I understand and I'm reading the data sheet right and to test them and so on and so forth. So that's why I have this board is because I wanted to test this DAC. But we'll see in a second what we're doing. So I have two channels on this DAC running. The first one I'm gonna show is channel B and I have it connected to an oscilloscope. So all I'm doing is running through each one of the 4,095 steps from zero to five volts. And then I set it to zero and start over again. So that's what channel B is outputting. So this is sort of a dynamic example of the DAC. But then channel A, I just wanna show some of the, what to expect as far as accuracy and resolution. So let me, this is 
I have this high accuracy, high resolution DMM connected to channel one of the DAC, channel A, and I'm outputting about 2.5 volts. It's actually the value of 2048, which isn't exactly 2.5 volts, but it's real close. What I wanna show here is if you notice, I'm tens of millivolts off, right? I should have about 2.5006 or one. So this is tens of millivolts, this is millivolts, and then this gets into microvolts. But if I play this, first of all, notice the air, and I'll explain what that's from. And then notice I'm also every three seconds changing from 2048 to 2047. So you can see that little jump in resolution. So I just went up. Now, if I go back down, I'm at 39, 38. And keep in mind, you know, this DMM or the DAC is not perfect. But, you know, when I make a change from one point to the next, I should see about 1.2 millivolts. And that's basically what I see here, but, but I'm off as far as my accuracy and my offset error. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch power supply. So I'm powering it off the Uno 5 volts. Now I'm gonna connect a linear power supply to it and I'm, that's what I'm doing now. And I'm, you're gonna see me turn on my linear power supply and I reset the Arduino just to start the communication over. And then I'm gonna go back to the voltmeter. So first of all, notice I have less offset error. You know, I'm much closer to what the true value should be. And the whole point of me showing this is because I'm using a power supply for VREF. So first I was using the USB that comes into the Arduino Uno. USB tends to be noisy, not very accurate. And also its voltage level can actually change based on the load. So if you're powering a lot of things and drawing a lot of current, you can actually see your power supply voltage jump around. It's referred to as line regulation. Now I'm connected to this linear power supply uh, that is actually going through a voltage regulator on that white board you saw, but it had a slightly more accurate five volts. And, and I'm not trying to compare these two power supplies. What I'm showing is if you want high accuracy, you need to use a voltage reference, an accurate one. A power supply is not a good one. And that's why we're seeing this variation. And in fact, if we had a more accurate power supply, I bet you this would be less offset error. But with both of these power supplies, you can still see the jumps. So we're at 12 now. Now we're at, we went to 13. Now we go back down to 12. So that's switching between the 2048 and 2047. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a glimpse into sort of accuracy and resolution. It's, it's a challenge if you want to get high accuracy when, when using something like this, or you have to understand the specs that affect it. Okay, that's it for part one. If you have any questions or if you wanna build on this with comments, use the comment section below. I love it when people add stuff because I can only cover so much in this, this time for this video. If you like what you saw, hit the thumbs up and I'll see you back here for part two. Thank you for watching.